happy to welcome our speaker tonight. He's a priest of the Ukrainian Catholic Eparchy of Chicago. Father David Anderson studied under Father Alexander Schmeyman at St. Vladimir's Seminary and was ordained in 1983. In addition to serving as a parish priest for 39 years, he has been both a teacher and a translator of patristic and Byzantine liturgical texts. He has presented many classes on liturgy and the church fathers throughout the country. He's presently the Byzantine Rite Chaplain at Wyoming Catholic College and also teaches for our Magdala Apostolate. So please join us in welcoming back to the Institute of Catholic Culture, Father David Anderson. Welcome, Father David. It's good to have you with us. Thank you so much, Father Hezekiah and Annie. Uh, good to be here. Good to see familiar faces and new faces. Let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O heavenly King, O comforter, the spirit of truth, who are everywhere present and filling all things, treasury of all blessings and giver of life, come dwell within us and cleanse us from every stain and save our souls, O gracious Lord. I'm going to sing the Byzantine troparion for the holy archangel Gabriel. O leader of the heavenly armies, we though always unworthy beseech you that with your prayers you would encircle us with the protection of the wings of your angelic glory. Guard us who bow low before you and fervently cry, deliver us from dangers. O Gabriel, leader of the hosts on high. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Father. Of course. Um, just uh, a, a moment I'll take uh, a, a little a little uh, anecdote to amuse you about icons of the Archangel Gabriel. He is often invoked, of course, uh, mostly because of his place at the Annunciation. That is his principal uh, manifestation where in the Byzantine hymnography he comes to Our Lady and says, what? What name shall I call you? What title shall I give you? I am bewildered, I am lost, but I shall greet you as I was commanded, halo full of grace. Um, but we also find Archangel Gabriel in the temple with Zechariah, and that may be one of the reasons why he is invoked by those in the church as the protector of those places where we gather for the, to worship uh, God. And so we ask him to defend our places of worship from all blasphemy, sacrilege, vandalism, and also uh, that he preserve those who gather in those places of worship, those houses of the church from all uh, division, heresy, and error. There is a uh, icon that one finds, especially sometimes in the Russian tradition. Uh, sometimes they place it right at the entry door of the church from the narthex to, uh, into the nave. And Gabriel is shown in a rather unusual uh, way, uh, holding a scroll and, and writing things on it. And we might ask, well, what on earth or in heaven <laughs> would the angel Arch Archangel Gabriel be doing writing, writing on a scroll and what he's writing on it in this icon are the names of those who come late to church. <laughs> so uh, the guardian of the church. Now, tonight we are speaking of sacred signs, sacred signs. So as I generally do in talks of this nature, we'll begin with the words themselves. Sacred signs, we could just as easily say holy signs. Sacred and holy are examples of how uh, the English language is a hybrid language. So it frequently has words that mean exactly the same thing, but they come from different linguistic roots. So the word uh, sacred, of course, comes from the Latin, derived from the Latin, and the word uh, holy 
uh, derives from the Anglo-Saxon or Germanic or Teutonic roots of English. But they both mean the same thing. The trouble is, the thing that they mean is not the easiest thing to describe. We use those words, holy, sacred, all the time. Yet uh, sometimes I ask my students in theology class here at Wyoming Catholic College uh, to try to give a brief definition of the word holy. And they're sometimes hard put to it. And I think that might be the case, not just with uh, students in theology, but with us in general. What does this word mean? Because it's a most unusual word in, in Hebrew, you know, it's kadosh. In, in Greek, it's agios. And particularly in Greek, because it's from the Greek uh, word that, that is used, especially liturgically, so much, holy, 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 which, of course, comes from the Hebrew, but was read by the early Christians in the Greek uh, language of the Septuagint. Uh, that word, the philologists tell us, is a very unusual word because even though agios is considered a Greek word, it actually antedates the Greek language itself. In other words, you can't find the sources in the Greek language for the words, for the word. Usually the prefix a in Greek means not, not something, not this, not that but not in the case of agios, it's not a prefix. And so the word as best we can define it, uh, agios, uh, sacer in, in Latin, is that which is other, other in the sense of the creator being other than the creature. It's what is specific and proper to the creator. So when we speak of sacred or holy signs, we're speaking of signs that have to do with God, with God. So we're not, strictly speaking, uh, talking about such things as octagonal stop signs or chemical symbols, H2O, CO2. We're talking of signs in a very specific way. Now the word for Greek, in Greek for sign is simeon, simeon not like simeon the name, but simeon. Uh, and it means that which points out or indicates. And there is a word that goes along with it. In fact, we will use the words together. I won't say that we'll use them interchangeably because there's a distinction. But nevertheless, the, the word sign is related to the word symbol, symbolon, which means to bring together, to join together, to unite. So a sign, a, sim, a sign that is a symbol is an indicator or a pointer that brings together. And if it is a sacred sign, sacred or a holy sign, meaning that it has to do with God, it brings together God and his creation. In Holy Scripture, the word sign is especially found in St. John's Gospel. Maybe some of you are, are well aware of this already, and because you've had, I think, many, many classes not from the Institute of Catholic Culture. And it and seems to me that people who, who come to these things, they, they tend to be on the well-read side of, of things. So uh, you, you've read St. John's Gospel, and you know that St. John the Evangelist used the word, uses the word sign to refer to the miracles of Jesus. He doesn't use the word thalma, which is the Greek word for miracle. He uses the word sign. After describing Jesus' 
transforming the water into wine at Cana in Galilee, St. John says in chapter two of his gospel, this first sign Jesus did in the presence of his disciples. And he manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is an echo of what we hear at the very beginning of St. John's gospel. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have beheld his glory the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So John's gospel has specifically seven signs. And, and we know anybody who's read Gospel of John, and especially the book of Revelation, know that there's all sorts of groups of sevens all through John's writings, because seven is a, a number of completion, fulfillment. And so if you were to look, for example, through John's gospel, the, the part of it that comes before the passion, namely uh, chapters 1 through 12, you would find seven events that are referred to as signs. And that is the miracle at Cana, the, the transformation of the water into wine. Then the second miracle of Cana, the healing of the nobleman's son, uh, then you would find the healing of the man at the sheep's pool, the paralyzed man at the sheep's pool. Then you would find the feeding of the 5,000 with the loaves and fishes. That's the third, or the fourth, rather. Then the fifth is Jesus walking on the water. And the sixth is his healing the man who was born blind in chapter nine. And the, the last, the ultimate sign before, before the great sign that's beyond all these signs, that the sign of the crucifixion and resurrection, the last sign before the passion is the raising of Lazarus. Why does St. John call these, these wonderful miracles of Jesus, simea, signs? Because they do specifically what the word means. They are pointers, they are indicators to who Jesus is. He manifests his glory through these signs. Those who see the signs with the eyes of faith know that he is the son of God. So that's the sense in which we speak of holy or sacred signs. Now, I want to read to you just a few lines from a collection of stories. Uh, I read this book when it first came out in 2020. It's called Big in Heaven. Uh, its story is written by an Orthodox priest, Father uh, Stephen Siniari, who was priest for some time of uh, a uh, little Albanian Orthodox church in Philadelphia. And so uh, once he retired, he, he began to, now this book of his stories has gotten quite a, uh, has attracted a considerable attention. You look on Ancient Faith Radio, for example, it will tell you that it's been nominated, I forget uh, for which one of the very, very prestigious awards for fiction. Uh, so these are, these are stories based on his experiences. They're not uh, biographical of other people, but the, the characters are given different, different names and such. Uh, but uh, I, you will enjoy them, I would say, if you enjoy the stories of Flannery O'Connor, because they're quite like them. And uh, that means that they have an edge to them. If you don't like stories with an edge, if you don't like stories with shock, that shock you, you might not like these so much. But I like them because I like Flannery O'Connor. But in one of the stories, uh, it's a dialogue between uh, the priest who in, this, in the stories is, is called Father Naum. Father Naum and his friend, the Protestant minister, who's, whose name is Cal, goes by the nickname Cal from Calvin. And they're talking about 
signs and symbols. And this is the exchange that goes on between them. Coffee time was coming to an end. They're having coffee together at a restaurant, the priest and the minister. Cal looked out the window. Almost to himself, he said, real presence or just symbolic? I'd like to discuss that sometime. Naum told his friend, I'd like to be able to explain unreal presence. Real presence or just symbolic? And the priest says, I'd like to be able to explain unreal presence. Now, of course, the author of this story, uh, for those who would be in the know, uh, is quoting a favorite line of Father Alexander Schmemann that he uh, expressed considerable skepticism over all the uh, divisive disagreements that have occurred in Christian history, particularly in the West, it must be said, about whether the Eucharistic presence of our Lord Jesus Christ is real or symbolic. And Father Alexander would say, why is a symbol not real? Why has, how have real and symbolic become opposed to each other as if they were opposites? Father Schmemann would say, I refuse to accept this uh, artificial construct of opposites because symbolic is not the opposite of real. The opposite of real is unreal. Thus, uh, Father Naum tells his friend in the story, I'd like to be able to explain unreal presence. And then the, the dialogue goes on. Father Naum would have liked to, have, to tell his friend about symbol as a sign to bring together. The opposite of symbol is not indicated by the word real as in it's a symbol or it's real. The opposite of symbol is diaboli. Symbolon, diabolon. And it doesn't, you don't have to be an expert in languages to know where diabolon will lead you. Because, of course, diabolus in Latin is the devil. And the English word devil is simply a derivative from that word that means the divider the separator. That's what Satan, uh, the Satan, as he's always referred to in the New Testament, although our English translations don't often make that clear to us, but the Satan is always there to divide. Uh, he tries, perhaps it could be, it could be uh, described as the most supreme act of his arrogance when he tempts our Lord in the wilderness and does so in a way in which he tries to divide the son from the father. Imagine a rebellious creature, a rebellious bodiless creature with will and intellect of a very superior sort, trying to divide the son of God from his father. If you are the son of God, feed yourself and make the, make the stones bread and feed yourself. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from the temple. If then, if you are the, if you are the son of God, the ultimate contradiction, uh, worship me and all these kingdoms of the world will be yours. And Jesus, who has come for one reason only, and that is to accomplish the will of his father, and who says in another place that he doesn't even have a will. Now that's of course, Jesus likes to speak in hyperbole, but it's to make a point. He doesn't have an independent will. I have not come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. We have just, uh, what, a uh, week and a couple days ago, celebrated in our country Independence Day. This is a dangerous word, dear friend. Uh, especially when it is projected from political independence 
to the independence of what we have come to call the individual. Because unfortunately, the independent individual is self-defined and therefore divided from everybody else, from God and other people, and from all of creation, lives in a imaginary constructed world of his or her own. And that's the ultimate triumph of the divider. So back to this story. The opposite of symbol is not indicated by the word real. The opposite of symbol is diaboli, to slander, to take a bite, to fragment, to divide. He wanted to tell his friend Cal, we both know his name, the divider, Diabolos, the biter, the one who takes a bite out of you, to tear you to bits. Last Sunday, in the lectionary of the Byzantine Rite, we had from St. Matthew, the uh, eighth chapter, the disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee, uh, and that's where they have the storm and the wind and the waves and Jesus calms them. Then they get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. That's the pagan side, the Eastern side, the Decapolis as it's called, no Jews live there. Uh, and there they, they encounter the man who is who has demons, the gospel says. He's the one that lives alone in the tombs and has to be chained down. He's a danger to other people and to himself because he's being bitten by the devourer, being divided from God, from people and from uh, his, himself actually. So, Story goes on. Cal, again, the Protestant minister friend of Father Naum, had a classical education, some Greek, but mostly Latin. He was half thinking aloud when he said, sacramentum, the Latin word, which originally is not a religious word. The church began to use it as such, but did not invent it. Sacramentum, the loyalty oath taken by Roman soldiers, or the pledge deposited in good faith between disputing parties in a court case. Father Noom said, I failed both Latin and Greek. <laughs> you failed Greek, Cal said. I believe you're telling me another one of your stories. Father Noom smiled. A good sower knows how and when to prepare the soil, how and when to scatter the seed, how and when to be still. He said, did I ever tell you the one called, and the devil went forth to sow his seed? Cal smiled and slowly said, no. And then this is the last line I'll read to you. Ask us Orthodox what time it is, and we'll tell you the whole history of the watch. So, holy symbols, holy signs are real. We will never ever understand them. And perhaps that's the wrong word to use. I should, I should better say, we will never experience them as they are meant to be experienced. Maybe our problem is we try too hard to understand what we're supposed to experience. Unless we realize that they do these holy signs connect us to God. Now, just today, I had two uh, direct encounters with holy signs. Uh, this afternoon was, was time uh, here at Wyoming Catholic College. Uh, one of the things that I have remained responsible for in the Byzantine Rite Chapel 
is I myself uh, prepare and bake the Eucharistic bread, the prospera. And when one does that, especially when one does it in the traditional way, which the church has established for it to be done, not just you know pouring something out of a container, one takes flour, measures it, puts in some salt, measures some water, water that's neither too warm nor too cool, puts yeast into it, pours it in the flour, then begins to pray psalms over this mixture uh, as it's kneaded till it becomes a proper dough. Then one waits for it to rise in the tradition of the Eastern churches. Then it's risen and you form the loaves. Traditionally in the Byzantine practice, each loaf has two layers for the divinity and humanity of Christ. You stamp the top layer with uh, letters in Greek, which are the abbreviations of Jesus Christ, the conqueror. You prick the loaves on the baking sheets with a toothpick or a skewer so that all the air will come out of them so that when the, when the bread is prepared for the divine liturgy, the, the priest doesn't cut into a loaf that's nothing but holes inside, it needs to be solid. Then you bake them. Don't want them to be so baked that they're dried out, but they got to be baked. This is a process that takes some time. Can't be done quickly. And I've done it. I, I've done it countless times. You know, I've been I've been a priest for uh, I'm in my uh, 40th year of my priesthood. And except in a couple of, of my churches, I had to bake the prosper. In, in some places there was there were people in the church who did it, but mostly I had to do it myself. I, so I've done it over and over and over again. It's part of me. Even the word that's used to describe those loaves, the prospera, meaning the offering, the oblation, the word itself is a sign. And then one reflects that uh, one is doing something that only a human person, an anthropos, to use the Greek, only a human person can do. Animals don't do it. They eat, but they eat food that comes directly from creation unless they're pets and, and they're given prepared food, but the food has been prepared by human beings. Angel don't bake bread, nor do they squeeze juice from grapes and have it ferment and wine comes into existence. It's only humans. Humans in the image and likeness of God. Humans that unlike the creator can't make something out of nothing as God does. But on the other hand, can make something out of something. God gave us that gift. We take what creation has. We take the wheat and the grapes. We grind flour. We squeeze the grapes. And then we end up after this really quite complex physical and chemical process. We end up with bread and wine. And these are offered to God. And they are in themselves signs, symbols of us. They have us, humanity, written all over them because it's only from us that they come. The Lord in the offerings that he has asked, asked of his people does not ask ordinarily for 
the simple products of creation, but rather the transformed products of creation. Why? Because he accepts what has been transformed and further transforms it. It's been transformed with a human change, a human transformation. And that which has been changed humanly is offered so that it may be transformed divinely from wheat and grapes to bread and wine to the mystical body and blood of the Lord that died and rose and, and reigns in glory whom death can no longer touch. So sometimes people, and, and in a sense, there's, uh, it's partly understandable, but we have to be very careful to recognize its limitations. Um, to, to use such language that, for example, the Eucharist is real and therefore it isn't symbolic. That's a false dichotomy, a false use of the word symbol, because it's dependent upon the idea that a symbol isn't real. Now I'll read to you another little passage. If you're not familiar with this book, I recommend it very highly. It's uh, one of the most well-known theologians of the 20th century, Romano Guardini, one of his first books. It's called, appropriately, the name of our talk tonight, Sacred Signs. And this is what he says. It's the introduction to the book. This little book has been in circulation some 10 years. It was written to help open up the world of the liturgy. That world, namely the, the world of the liturgy, the world, uh, uh, forgive me for digressing, I say I'm going to read them, I, I talk a lot of my own, but they, it goes together in the end. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, in his autobiographical work, Milestones, talks about how he became at home in the world of the liturgy when he was a boy. He said it began even before his, his intellect was, was functioning very much. It began on the day of his baptism. He happened to be born on Holy Saturday. And as, as Christian parents often did in, in previous times, his parents wanted him baptized right away. And what better day for baptism than Holy Saturday at the Paschal Vigil? The Paschal Vigil in those days uh, was done rather earlier in the day than we, than we customarily do it now. We do it later, but then it was done earlier in the day. And even though it was light outside, the parishioners in this little church in Bavaria had put blackout curtains, like, you know, Europeans had become used to use it, using during the wars, blackout curtains on all the windows of the church, all through Holy Week, he says. And therefore, the church was pitch dark inside, except for what candles that were lit. And at the Gloria of the Paschal Vigil, all those blackout curtains came tumbling down. Uh, those of you who perhaps remember the, the older traditional Paschal Vigil in the Latin Rite will remember that at the glory of the Paschal Vigil, all the purple veils were taken off the statues. And it was an extremely powerful image. You never had to ask, what does that mean? It was so obvious. That's what a true sign, a true symbol does. Once a symbol has to be given, a sacred sign has to be given a long, complicated explanation, the battle's been lost because it conveys itself. It is the link 
to that which it signifies. So uh, Pope Benedict uh, says in Milestones that on that day, he received the, the grace of the second birth in baptism. And from then on, as he, uh, uh, during his boyhood and in the years following, he was completely at home in the liturgical life of the church. It's, wor it's world of signs and symbols that convey mystical realities, or, or to say it another way, that bring to us the presence of the glory of God. So back to uh, Romano Guardini, whose books uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict read when he was young, talks about the world of the liturgy in which we are meant to be at home, the world of signs and symbols, will never be made accessible by accounts of how the certain rites and prayers came into existence and under what influences, or by explanations of the ideas underlying liturgical practices. That's a loaded expression. Explanation of the ideas. Contemporary people have become obsessed with the explanation of ideas. And unfortunately, sacred symbols and signs become reduced simply to the level of ideas. Even faith sometimes is reduced to the level of ideas, but faith is not about, about ideas. Faith is the reality of realities. So, Romano Gordini goes on to say, those ideas may be true and profound, but they are not apparent in the liturgy. They, cannot, they, they can be, deduced, be deduced from it only by scholarly research. The liturgy is not a matter of ideas, but of actual things. And of actual things as they now are, not as they were in the past. I mentioned I did two things today that were direct contact with sacred signs. I prepared the Eucharistic bread. The other was a much quicker and simpler act. I came to the chapel this evening for Vespers before coming to uh, present this talk to you. And I saw that the altar lamp need to be re needed to be replaced. And in the, in the tradition that I love very much, try as best I can, to keep the same flame that was blessed at the Paschal Vigil going all year long in the altar lamp, the sanctuary lamp. So I saw that, that it was getting toward the bottom and I replaced it with a new candle before the old one would burn out. Now, why do that? That the presence of that light, that light that manifests the light that darkness cannot extinguish. The beginning of the Paschal Matins in the Byzantine Rite, the priest says, come receive the light not overcome by night. Come glorify Christ who is risen from the dead. And that those words are inspired by the words of the Gospel of John. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness could not extinguish it. Now, that holy light, as we call it, speaks for itself. It is the holy sign in the presence, in, in, in the present age of the light of the age to come, the light of the day that knows no evening. Now, the world of the liturgy is that world of these sacred signs. So, as Guardini says, of actual things, of actual things as they now are, not as they were in the past. It is a continuous movement carried on by and through us and its forms and actions issue from our human nature. So these very real human things, bread and wine, candles, candles that are made by us. Again, uh, neither apes nor angels make candles. Anthropy, human beings make them. 
And they make them in such a way that, at least traditionally, they are composed of valuable material. Beeswax and olive oil have always been on the pricey end of things, not just in modern times. I, I, by the way, it makes me sad to see cheap substitutes used on the holy altar, like petroleum waste products and such, that often the, the cheaper candles are, are made from now. Where is our expression in, in the world of the worship that is revealed to us in the scripture and the tradition of the church that we give to God the best? So this consuming of the best to give light and that light being the continuation of the light of Pascha, the light of Easter, the light of the night in which all becomes day, the resurrection of Christ from the dead. That is the holy sign. Well, this book of Guardini's goes on to say, uh, a short article by Maria Montessori, of, of, I, of whom I'm sure most of you are familiar with, whose work in education is so significant, made me feel when I read it, that here was both the fulfillment of these ideas and their promise for the future. Her method is to teach by actual doing. In one of her schools, the children take care of a vineyard and a wheat field. They gather the grapes, sow and harvest the grain, and, and as far as they can technically manage it, make according to the rules of the church, wine and bread, and then present it to the priest for use at the altar. This kind of learning together with the right kind of instruction is liturgical education. For the approach to the liturgy is not by being told about it, but by taking part in it. We must consider this with great seriousness, especially those of us who are involved in what is called catechesis. That we do not imagine our, that we are able to convey these realities simply by talking about them as ideas. They are visible as everyone knows the catechism definition of the sacrament, that it is the visible means, the visible sign instituted by Christ so that his grace and what is his grace? Grace is not some ethereal substance floating out around out there. Grace is the presence of the glory of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory full of grace and truth. Archangel Gabriel greets our lady, hail full of grace. It certainly does not mean that Our Lady is full of some mysterious substance. It means, as Archangel Gabriel goes on to say, that the Holy Spirit will come upon her and the power of the Most High will overshadow her and will do so because she is, in fact, already full of the grace of the Holy Spirit. When he greets her as full of grace, he literally is saying, he uses uh, grammatically a perfect passive participle. Kere ke taritomani. Hail you who have been filled and are full of grace. So these gracious signs. Now, we've spoken already of a, a few bread, wine. By the way, uh, we also must be very careful when we wish to convey the reality of the change that the divine transformation affects in our bread and wine, which bear the marks of ourselves upon them. 
Now, now many, perhaps most of us, are formed mainly by the Western theology of St. Thomas Aquinas, substance and accidents, you know. Well, let's not dismiss what St. Thomas calls those accidents. Because without them, you don't have the Eucharist. There is, no, there is no Eucharist without those forms, appearances, accidents, as, as he uses the Aristotelian expression, of bread and wine. In fact, the church teaches, and this is, this is upheld in all of the apostolic churches, if the appearances of bread and wine disappear somehow through age or, or, or spoiling, you don't have the Eucharist anymore. If the appearances of bread and wine disappear through what are called Eucharistic miracles, paradoxically, the Eucharistic miracle that no longer appears as bread and wine cannot, cannot be used as the Holy Eucharist anymore. It may be venerated, but it cannot be used as Eucharistic communion because Eucharistic communion must have the appearances of bread and wine. So those symbols, those signs, those connections, those indicators, those pointers are all central. Now let us proceed from visible things, bread, wine, candles, to things that are not uh, objects, but rather dimensions of our life. For example, postures of worship, standing, kneeling, or the cycles of time, morning, noon, evening, weeks, months, years. These things also are in our liturgical tradition, and of course our liturgical tradition is the world in which we meet God. So let me, uh, uh, no, no talk of, of mine is ever complete without some words from my teacher, but uh, here are just a few words of Father Alexander Schmemann. He says that the liturgical experience of the church is, and now he uses one of those fancy theological expressions that sometimes people stumble over, but they're not that difficult to understand if we just uh, pay attention a little bit. He says that it is eschatological symbolism, eschatological symbolism of the liturgy eschatological signs, these holy signs and symbols. And eschatological simply refers to the eschaton, which simply refers to the end of the age, which simply refers to the ultimate things, that which is ultimate. So to say that the signs and symbols of the liturgy are ultimate or eschatological refers, first of all, to the belief central and overwhelming in the early Christian community that the coming of Christ, his life, his death and resurrection from the dead, his ascension to heaven and ascending by him on the day of Pentecost of the Holy Spirit have brought about the Lord's day. Brought about the Lord's day. The day of God announced by the prophets. And this has inaugurated the new age of the kingdom of God. There is a form of, of Gnosticism that is commonly referred to as the new age. But this is a counterfeit use of the expression because there is truly a new age. There is the new and eternal age of the kingdom of God. We 
say that we await it every time when we profess the Nicene Creed. I look for the resurrection of the dead and literally the life of the age to come. We use the older English sometimes, the life of the world to come, but it, literally it says in, in the original Greek text, the life of the age to come. And we say that the life of the age to come has been given us now. That's the mystery of the church. That we are given now what is to come. In the Byzantine tradition, every time we celebrate the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, and we give thanks to God in the, in the anaphora, the Eucharistic prayer, you have not ceased to do everything until you brought us to heaven and granted us your kingdom, which is to come. You have granted us your kingdom, which is to come. That's the ultimate final eschatological sign and symbol. What is its presence? Where do we find its presence in time? Because, as Father Guardini has said, these are real things, not ideas. So they've got to be found. They have to have an incarnate expression. Where do we find the age to come in time? We find it on the Lord's day, the Lord's day. Uh, here at Wyoming Catholic College, we have a summer program. We call it peak because there's lots of mountain peaks around here. We live in a valley surrounded by mountain peaks in Lander, Wyoming. And so we have uh, groups of high school students that come each, they, each group comes for two weeks in the summertime, and they have two weeks of Wyoming Catholic college life in a kind of uh, slightly less intense form than when you're really here as a student. But there's liturgical life and there's classes and there's trips to the wilderness and such. And so uh, the, the, the kids, as I call them, here for peak last Saturday night, came to the Byzantine chapel for Great Vespers. And of course, it's the Saturday evening Great Vespers that ushers in the Lord's Day, not just in the Byzantine tradition, but in every apostolic liturgical tradition. The evening begins the new day. It follows the biblical rhythm in the book of Genesis. There was evening, there was morning the first day. So, Sunday begins on Saturday evening, and properly it begins with the evening service. The idea of beginning it with an anticipated Sunday morning liturgy is a, a 20th century production that I won't comment much on. <laughs> but Sunday begins with the evening prayer of the church on Saturday evening, and so these kids were here for a our long vesper service in which hymns and psalms of the resurrection of Christ welcoming the day of the Lord. And I said to them afterwards, uh, this service of, of the resurrection vespers on, on the eve of the Lord's day that, usher in, that ushers in the Lord's day, this is the great big hug and kiss that the church gives each week to her bridegroom to welcome his day. The day that the early Christians loved to call the eighth day, because you can't find anything from the seven days that repeat themselves. You can't find any place in the seven days really for the eighth day. The eighth day is beyond them all. The book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament says there's nothing new under the sun. The church says, as she ushers in the Lord's day, yes, there is, and it took place on the eighth day, the day of the Lord's resurrection. And this is how we welcome it, I told the kids. So the coming of the Lord's day itself is a sacred sign, a sacred symbol. A link, a link in time, 
to that which is beyond time. Likewise, the flowing of time throughout the day, Father Guardini says concerning time, time sanctified. Through each hour of the day, though, excuse me, not through, but though each hour of the day has its own character, three hours stand out from the rest. Morning, evening, and halfway between them, noonday, and have an aspect distinctively their own. These three hours the church has consecrated. The Psalms speak of it in the evening, in the morning, and at noon. I bless you all. Of them all, the morning hour wears the most shining face, it possesses the energy and brightness of a beginning. Mysteriously, each morning we are born again. We emerge out of sleep refreshed, renewed, hopefully, with an invigorating sense of being alive. And this we must profess the moment uh, our feet hit the floor, rising from our, our place of sleep, no matter what our emotions are doing to us at the moment, or, what, or no matter what our body is feeling at the moment. I am, I in one more year will reach 70 years of age. My body does not feel like it did 40 years ago. Yet, beyond the feeling of the moment comes the essential reality that my first act must be this glorifying God who has given me freely, not because of an accident, given me life, not out of compulsion, but out of desire. He has given me life. So this invigorating sense of being alive, this newly infused feeling of our existence turns to a prayer of thanksgiving for life to him who gave it. We begin the day in God's name and strength and ask him to make our work a work for him. This morning hour when life reawakens, we are most keenly aware of our existence. When we begin the day with gratitude for our creation and turn to our work with fresh creative power is a holy hour. It is plain how much depends on this first hour. It is the day's beginning the day may be started without a beginning. The day may be slipped into without thought or intention, but such a day without purpose or character hardly deserves the name. It is no more than a torn off scrap of time. A day is a journey. One must decide which way one is going. A single day is the whole of life. The whole of life is like a day. The morning hour exercises the will, directs the intention, and sets our gaze wholly upon God. Often people come to me for confession or for spiritual direction. We talk about prayer. And I often will ask people, especially when I'm first getting to know them, how they pray, in addition to coming to the liturgical services of the church. And I would say that the majority of people say that if they do pray daily, they tend to wait until the end of the day. They say that uh, the morning is not easy for them. They say, I am not a morning person. They say, in the morning is when I am most overwhelmed by the coming responsibilities of the day. It is difficult for me to pray. And I try to guide them, saying that that point of rising again in the morning is the fountainhead of the whole day. Learn from the example of the prayer of the church. Any of you who are familiar with the divine office, the liturgy of the hours, no matter what tradition it is, when are the longest offices of the day? Always early in the morning. 
look at any breviary, any book of ours, any horologion, as the very as the various traditions uh, uh, describe it. You'll see that the services as the day goes on get shorter and shorter. Finally, compline at the end of the day is the shortest of all. But the morning, the morning is the longest. In the full divine office, for example, when, when it is expected today, uh, uh, not, excuse me, not today, but, but yesterday was Feast of St. Benedict. And St. Benedict in his rule exhorts the monks, and he doesn't think of the monks as somehow isolated from everybody else. He says they must at least pray through the Psalter uh, once a week. He says, if you don't do at least once a week, you're not worthy to be called a monk. <laughs> now, people who aren't technically monks uh, should be praying the Psalms and may not be able to pray a whole Psalter each week, but they should imitate that rhythm somehow. And if you're familiar with the divine office, most of the Psalms, the great bulk of the Psalms, where are they prayed? They, they're prayed at matins and lots. That's because the prayer at the beginning of the day is the fountain of the day. The morning is a sacred sign and symbol. Likewise, noon, we're, we're going to have to come to an end, so I can't read too many uh, more passages. But nevertheless, Guardini says this about noon. In the morning, we have a lively and agreeable sense that life is starting and is on the increase. Then obstacles arise and we are slowed down. By noon for a short while, we seem to stand quite still. A little later, our, our sense of life declines. We grow weary, recover a little, and then subside into the quiescence of night. Halfway between the rising and the setting sun, when the day is at its height, now this could, I, I could succumb, I don't have time to do it, I could succumb, succumb to the temptation to talk about how we have unnaturally distanced ourselves from morning and evening by uh, making day into night and night into day. So sometimes some of us don't even know which is what after a while. But nevertheless, halfway between the rising and the setting sun when the day is at its height comes a breathing space, a brief and wonderful moment. The future is not pressing and we do not look ahead. The day is not yet declining and we do not look back. It is a pause, but not of weariness. Our strength and energy are still at the full, for noonday is the pure present. It looks beyond itself. It looks upon eternity. So he recommends us to take the noon hour as an image of the eternal present of God. You see how time itself in this way becomes not the empty fuel that Many of you have, have heard some of my other talks, and I always quote uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who, who laments people who regard time as simply a fuel to be burnt up. Burn up time in order to, to uh, express your dominion, your control over your little space. Time regarded only as a fuel to... to uh, feed my desire to control the fiction that I call my life, my life, my individuality that has no meaning unless it's in communion with God and others. Now, morning, noon, and evening, let's, since we are reaching evening, maybe this is where we should conclude. Evening also has its mystery. The mystery of evening is death. The day draws to a close and we make ready to enter the silence of sleep. The vigor which came with the morning has by evening run down and what we seek then is rest. The secret note of death is sounded. And though our imaginations may be too crowded with the day's doings or too intent on tomorrow's plans for us to hear it distinctly, some perception of it, however remote, does reach us. And there are evenings when we have very much the feeling that life is drawing on to the long night in which no man can work. That's quoting the 
Lord's words in the Gospel of John, night comes when no man can work. What matters is to have a right understanding of what death means. Dying is more than the end of life. Dying is the last summons that life serves on us. Dying is the final, the all decisive act. There has been a very unfortunate change that has come. It, it's directly proportional to the loss of faith, where increasingly people, if they, uh, if, if they re regard death as something to be denied altogether, pretend that it's not there, but, but also people have the tendency to regard death passively as something that's going to come for them. But our ancestors in the faith and the saints and our Lord Jesus Christ himself gave themselves to death when, when the hour for it had come. They were not passive, simply passive victims of it. Even the martyrs, especially the martyrs, who, of course, could have postponed their death by denying faith. Nevertheless, through faith, embraced death. St. Francis, in his Canticle of the Sun, the last gift that in creation that he gives thanks to God for is sister death. Not that death is not the enemy which is to be destroyed, for it is the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Yet Christ has destroyed it by his divine and life-giving death and made it not the road to oblivion, but the road to God. As St. Paul says, not that I be unclothed, that I be further clothed. So it's with that realization that we embrace the evening. The high art of dying says Romano Gordini, is to accept the life that is leaving us and by a single act of, of affirmation, put it into God's hands. Each evening, we should practice this high art of giving life an effectual conclusion by reshaping the past and impressing it with a final validity and an eternal character. The evening hour is the hour of completion. We place ourselves before God, to whom all time, past or future, is the living present, before God was able to restore to the penitent even what is lost. What was not well done, contrition seizes upon and thinks anew. For what was well done, we give God humble thanks, sincerely taking no credit to ourselves. What we are uncertain about or failed to accomplish, the whole sorry remnant, we sink in entire abandonment into God's all-powerful love. So I think with that, I'll close. Christian life is the life of sacred signs. Those signs are realities, not ideas. They are doors, they are windows into the life that we await in the creed, the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come. And ever increasingly, we need to be more and more at home in the true world of the holy signs. Thank you for your kind attention. Wow. Father David, thank you so much. Just a beautiful reflection tonight. Very much appreciated. All right. Father David, are you ready for some questions? Sure. Okay, awesome. Let me pull up the question sheet here. First of all, Father, um, could our worship be affected if it takes place in a space that would be devoid of symbols, like, you know, say like a mega church, some sort of Protestant church that, that doesn't really value symbolism the way that Catholicism does? Uh, the, well, the, the short answer to that question is definitely yes. Uh, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing a haphazard about our worship. Uh, beginning with 
the, you could say, the prototype of our worship. You want to know the, the prototype of, of traditional Christian worship? Read the Apocalypse. Read the book of Revelation. There it is. It's being in the, in the presence of the throne of God and the Lamb. And all of that in the context of the eternal present of God. That's why St. John in the Apocalypse uses all of that uh, from the point of view of, of, you know, tunnel, the tunnel vision of this life. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, here's an example. I saw, St. John says, a lamb standing as if slain. Wow. Plain animals don't stand. <laughs> See, but but that eternal reality of the one who is slain and risen, victorious over death. Now, that atmosphere of the glory of God, the temple, where where in the first covenant it was. That's where time and eternity, or the the two words that are used for time. Kronos and Keros uh, intersected. That threefold structure that, that a traditionally built, no matter what architecture style it follows, a traditionally built Christian church structure has that triple, uh, that triple uh, presence of the narthex, the nave, the sanctuary. There are in Father Guardini's book, there are there's a very wonderful chapter about doors. Going through doors, usually more than one in a traditionally built church. As John went through the door, I saw in heaven an open door and a voice said to me, come up here. So the door is is the sacred sign of the passage from time into eternity. The, so the atmosphere of worship combines art, architecture, iconography, chant, all of them into a harmonious whole. Now, there have been times, both in the early days of the church where, there, where public worship by Christians was not permitted in the Roman Empire, and also those times have continued in other forms than Roman persecutions throughout history. And, and probably more Christians were martyred in the 20th and 21st century for continuing to worship when the, uh, hostile political regimes did not permit it. And so, and so uh, Christians have to sometimes worship in in places that are that are not set apart for worship but it's interesting you know i'm a priest of the ukrainian greek catholic church uh the patriarch of of which is patriarch Svetoslav. and during during the the many weeks of after the war the aggressive war of russia against against ukraine broke out where was the patriarch to be found he was to be found underground he was to be found in bomb shelters with his people. But even there, they did everything they could to bring, to bring icons, to bring singing, to celebrate the liturgy in, in the most traditional way that was possible. So a, a site, a venue that, that is there because there is no, no possibility of of having the church services in their, in their traditional way. That's one thing, but it should be the exception, not the rule. And so churches, so-called church structures that are made contrary to the tradition of the church, the sacred tradition of art, architecture, and iconography, uh, they do, uh, let's say, get in the way instead of, instead of opening the door or, or serving as a window from, from time to eternity, they instead can become an obstruction. So, so always we have to be uh, evaluating the things that we build and the way that we adorn the things that we build, that we do it in a way that is in accord with the, the tradition 
that has been passed down to us through the best expressions of Christian worship in, in, in our, our respective uh, rites, for example. Does that, does that answer, or at least attempt to answer? Absolutely. So, so it's not at all, so I, I guess to say it briefly another way, uh, these things we do not consider as, you know, uh, I'll use uh, illustrations from food. We don't consider them icing on the, on the cake or gravy on the meat. You know, it's not, they're not uh, secondary decorations. They're, everything in the liturgy is sacramental because the church itself is a sacrament. The first use of the word sacrament uh, was made by St. Irenaeus of Lyon, who said he didn't speak yet of the seven sacraments that we're all used to speaking of. He said that Christ is the sacrament of the Father and the church is the sacrament of Christ. Christ reveals the Father and the church reveals Christ to us. So everything about the life of the church is revelatory. My teacher, Father Shemem, used to say, is epiphanic, is an epiphany of the kingdom of God. So we should not be casual about any of it. Someone who is as great a teacher of the spiritual life as St. Teresa of Avila, for example, a great, a great woman, one of the giants of the church, so also said things like, when she was not talking about the, the heights of the mystical union with God, she's talking about other things, she said, I would lay down my life. Of course, she was a good, good emotional Spaniard. She said, I would lay down my life for the least of the church's rites and ceremonies. <laughs> I really appreciated um, what you had to say about we first transform uh, the symbols and then God divinely transforms them. That was really a beautiful uh, insight. What do we do about, you know, the Eucharistic uh, problem that we have, you know, with so many people, you know, the crisis, so many people not believing in the real presence? Mm. Well, first of all, the, it is, it's, uh, essential that the that those in the church who are responsible for teaching the bishop the bishops and the priests teach clearly what is said in the gospel and what is said in in throughout all of the liturgical traditions of the various rites and the fathers of the church that their teaching be a clear expression of that so what the faithful are being taught is is the you know the word the word orthodox, which, which all Catholics should use, uh, sometimes we use it in a limited way. We talk about Catholic churches and Orthodox churches, but that's not really the, the right use of the word. The word orthodox refers to the faith and the worship of the church. And the word Catholic refers to the unity uh, of, the, of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So the orthodox faith of the Catholic church, that's the right way to use those two adjectives, Catholic and orthodox. And orthodox means right teaching and right, belief, right praising, right worshiping. And again, there's nothing, there's nothing obscure or vague about that. The sources in the traditions are, in the tradition is clear. Scriptures, the liturgical texts themselves, the teaching of the fathers and, and the creeds and councils of the church. So everything that is taught in our churches should be faithful to all of those sources of tradition. Uh, remember, however, that when our Lord himself has recorded in the sixth chapter of St. John's gospel, talk about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, that most of the, uh, most of the audience left him. Mm. It is a hard saying, they said. Uh, and, but Jesus uh, does not at that moment in the gospel try to call them back. He does not say, oh, they're misinterpreting him. They're misunderstanding him. He lets them go and then says to the disciples, are you going to go away too? And that's when Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. So this, this means of union with him, just think of how uh, sometimes, you know, we never, we never lay aside the official doctrines. They remain normative for us. But sometimes we have to directly face 
the amazing reality of what the Lord has taught us. That that uh, he did not he did not say, well, you know, uh, after I've ascended and the, and sent the Holy Spirit, you'll have you'll have ideas to remember me by. Uh, you can you can think of me, you can read about me, or you can pray even. He says you will have me. You will have me as your food and drink. You will take me into your mortal selves. And, and by that, you will taste, as, as we like to say in the Byzantine Eucharistic uh, hymn, you will taste the fountain of immortality. Not as, not as some idea that you have within you, but as the, the substantial reality of life. That is how I will be with you until the end of the age. So we, we, must, you know, we must continually uphold, teach, and live that central, as the language of the church calls it, the source and summit of our life in Christ, that we are united to him consubstantially. We are united to him personally, not simply in thought or, or intellect, but in actual union of persons, a union that is closer than any union in this world. A union that's closer that, than his disciples had with him before his death and resurrection and ascension. St. Peter says that when he writes to the Christians, the first Christians, that they believe without seeing and, and their belief without seeing is a greater thing than the apostles who saw him. St. Thomas heard the Lord Jesus say to him that those who have not seen yet believe are more blessed than those who saw. We have to take him at his word. I think that is a beautiful place to end our evening. Father David, just so much to reflect on here. Thank you so much again for, for all of your thoughts and your reflections this evening. Thank you all very much again. Shall we have prayer? I know I saw a lot of hands and we probably could have gone on with questions for a long time, but- uh, Well, we like sitting at the feet of the master, that is for sure. Yeah, <laughs> we could have gone on for a long time, but yes, please, Father, if you would, if you would, uh, please close us in prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, amen. The Father is our hope, the Son is our refuge, the Holy Spirit is our protector. All Holy Trinity, glory be to you. Beneath your protection, we take refuge. Holy Virgin Theotokos, do not despise our supplications in adversity, but deliver us from harm, O ever glorious and blessed Virgin. God is with us through his grace and love for mankind, always now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen.